Hi, this is Denise LaRosa, and you're listening to Mom Talk with Denise LaRosa, where moms get together to share our joys and challenges, while also providing listeners with some invaluable resources and information on parenting. Thank you for joining me today. Remember, this show is about you, so please become an active participant by visiting www.deniseandlarosa.com, liking my Facebook page, Mom Talk with Denise LaRosa, and follow me on Twitter, at Denise in La Rosa. My guest for today is one half of a co-parenting team. Disha Filia is co-author of Co-Parenting 101, Helping Your Kids Thrive in Two Households After Divorce. After their marriage ended, Disha and Michael D. Thomas became the poster children for divorce among their circle of friends and colleagues. While they wished they could have been the poster children for a successful marriage, it didn't quite work out that way. Despite the problems that ended their marriage, Disha and Michael managed to establish a congenial co-parenting partnership that allows their two daughters to thrive. In 2008, they co-founded coparenting.org to connect with other co-parents and to offer advice, support, and encouragement. In 2013, their book, Co-Parenting 101, Helping Your Kids Thrive in Two Households After Divorce, was published. Both their book and their site are resources for those who find themselves parenting after divorce or breakup. Speaking engagements, workshops, and their blog talk radio show, Co-Parenting Matters, are other ways Disha and Michael support parents, educators, and others serving children and families. I spoke with Disha about her experience with divorce and co-parenting, and I was amazed by her strength and commitment to her children. With the divorce rate in America rising, Disha and Michael's work is much needed to help families thrive through such a challenging situation. Take a listen to our conversation. Well, you're amazing. I just, I'm oh, just thank you. I'm going to jump right into this interview because it really is important to me to get this message out because I'm a married mom. I'm not um, a divorced mom. Mm-hmm. I have experienced that as a daughter. I've been a product right. of what you would call a broken home or whatnot, but I was blessed that it was very, um, it was a very pleasant and positive experience for the children uh, for the most part. Of course, there's glitches mm-hmm. in there, but uh, sure. my, mom, my mom didn't even have visitation hours or anything like that set up. It was an open door policy, and so mm-hmm. it, it really had a very, it had very little impact on the children directly. So right. I will start off by asking you to tell us about your journey as a mother and your experience with the divorce. Okay. Um, I was um, a full-time mom, and I mean full-time in not a great way. <laughs> when my oldest child was born, I was a stay-at-home mom and really kind of thought that all of my waking hours had to be devoted to her. So, you know, being able to stay at home with her was really a gift. Um, But by the time my younger daughter um, was born, um, and my kids are five years apart, um, I was in a different space where I I kind of realized that I had to do something for myself. So I continued to be, you know, very... um, devoted and, and very attentive and um, really you know, proud of the mom that I am. I don't get it all right, um, but you know, definitely believed in putting my children first and um, being, a, being very respectful of them as people and very nurturing. And so out of that um, grew my approach to parenting after divorce. Um, and thankfully, my ex and I were on the same page with that in that we felt like um, the divorce was trauma enough that, you know, we wanted to do everything that we could beyond that to um, make things as stable for our kids as possible to help them, you know, with the healing process of divorce Um, because we, you know, didn't have any delusions that this was not a trauma to them. And so we knew that to make that happen, we had to partner and we had to keep doing what we'd always done, which is think about their needs, see the world through their eyes. Um, you know, do what we needed to do for them, even though it wasn't always easy for us. Um, And that included, um, in the beginning, you know, our partnering with each other. Um, You know, there were a lot of ugly things happening behind the scenes um, when we were going through the legal process of our divorce, um, but our kids were spared that. And and so I think that was a continuation of how I've always parented in that, you know, I've always just wanted the best for my kids and, and wanted to be mindful um, of my duties to them. Wow, that is nothing short of incredible, Disha, because let's just keep it real here. How <laughs> fair is that? You know what I mean? Like, we as parents, we say that we put our children first, and I believe that a lot of um, parents truly, sincerely feel that way, and they are trying, 
But then when it comes to divorce and how messy it can be and the reasons behind the divorce, it's so hard to draw that line uh, and mm-hmm. not let the children be affected because you are filled with this hurt and you almost want to shout it out to the mountaintop, like, this person hurt me and this is what they did. Right. And you may feel like they're a nasty person um, on, on a personal level, but at the end of the day, that is your child's parent. So right. I just, I really commend you guys for that. And how, with a divorce happening, how could you manage to push past that pain of your personal experience with your partner. I mean, you just put your children first, you said. And is is it that simple? No, well, it's simple in that I think it's simple that we need to do it. Like, it's not complicated what needs to happen. The execution, not so simple. Um, And so, you know, for us, it was a process. It was over time. It was, you know, separately, um, you know, we did our own counseling and things like that. Separately, you know, we had friends that we could, um, you know, confide in. But we also had to get friends um, who, in some ways, they were struggling with our divorce like we were, we had to kind of push back because, you know, it was like a game of telephone. You know, somebody said something to one of the friends, and then they reported to me, mm-hmm. and they report back to him. And so once we – it was like two years of that. And then when we realized, wait a minute, we need to get them – you know, we love them, and we know they mean well, <laughs> but, you know, yeah. they're kind of negatively influencing it, and we need to talk directly to each other. But we were both operating from a place of fear you know, not really knowing what the other person was thinking and fearing the worst and things like that. Um, but once we said, okay, let's let's just take a step back and really, you know, communicate with each other, um, it, was a, it was really helpful. So it just took some time. Like we couldn't necessarily um, engage as comfortably as we do now. You know, we, um, our, our mutual families, he's remarried, I'm remarried. You know, we do a lot of holidays and things together. We all vacation together once a year. And we've always done that um, from the time we separated, uh-huh. but it's more comfortable now. At the time, it was like, we're doing this for the kids, we're doing this for the kids. Um, yeah. And, you know, even just drop-offs and pickups were more intense and things like that. But over time, and we did our own healing and our own soul searching and made our own peace. And I think it, that we gave each other that space, mm-hmm. you know, that, that helped a lot. And even though, you know, we were dating other people at different points, um, our kids didn't meet anybody until it was ultimately the person that became their stepdad and the person who became their stepmom. And so we didn't, I know a lot of people, it's hard where they're trying to heal, they're trying to get used to this, and then here's some new person. So, you know, we were both dating, but that was not a part of our co-parenting situation at all. So we had that awareness, but it was not like the kids were meeting anybody. So it kind of gave us time and space to get okay. And then after several years, then, you know, it's introducing a new partner. So we really just kind of took our time. Gotcha. And I'm going to jump back to that with adding um, other uh, people into that whole situation as far as uh, remarrying or dating. So Mm -hmm. basically you're saying you had to actively make that choice and then back it up with action. It wasn't just something, you know, a thought or a wish or a hope. You had to actively uh, work at getting to a place where it's definitely work and it's definitely commitment, you know, and it's like any other commitment that you make um, to your child. It's just that, you know, there's this sort of elephant in the room, you know, around it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have to say that I felt like I had already hurt them and I didn't want to hurt them anymore. And so, you know, to see me and their dad either sitting together at their school event or sitting near each other at the school event, you know, that made a difference. Um, and early on, we would all go to dinner like once a month because what we wanted them to know is that they were still part of a loving family. Now, their family was in two households. They were still part of a family. They were still safe. They were still cared for. They were still loved. They still, you know, had a sense of stability. They knew where they were going to be on which nights, and they knew that they could still count on both of us. And so I didn't want to do anything that would disturb that for them, you know, and disturb that peace. And so seeing my kids being able to thrive and still be, you know, doing well in school and getting along and, and, you know, becoming emotionally healthy, you know, that was my motivation to keep going. Um, even when it was hard, even when the experience of the divorce, you know, I, I, you know, that's what kept us, you know, on the straight and narrow. And, you know, there, and, and knowing 
how to have resources outside of my ex. Like how I felt about him it was not his concern anymore. So I had to go tell somebody else, you know, tell a therapist, tell a friend, whatever, and not necessarily engage him on all of the things that bugged me. And, and the same for him. You know, I know there were things about me that bugged him. Um, and, you know, we've even talked and laughed about that stuff now. But at the time, you know, we had to find other ways to get our needs met and to become, you know, emotionally strong. And because, you know, as your kids are healing, you've got to heal too. Um, so right. the kids are really our motivators. That's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And you were so blessed, Keisha, that you had um, a person, I, I, you know, how do I, like, you know, a husband then turned ex-husband that was on board as well that had the same goal and was aspiring to achieve the same thing, which was to see that your children thrive despite uh, what was happening between the two of you. So uh, what are some practical first steps that you recommend people take when being placed in a situation um, where they are now co-parents? They went from being in this nuclear setting and now they're separated. Right. Um, I think the first thing is to see that there are two relationships. There is the co-parenting relationship, and then there's the relationship that the parent, the child has with that parent. And I think when people run into trouble is when they can't separate them out. So somebody can be just a horrible spouse, terrible, but a great parent or an okay parent. Either way, Mm -hmm. you know, it's two separate roles. And so the kind of um, frustration and anger and disappointment um, and vendettas and things that we want to have because of how this person was as a, a spouse or now ex-spouse going through the divorce, um, it doesn't change the fact that the child has a right to a loving, comfortable, unhindered relationship with both parents. And so I think it's for people to see that those two relationships are separate and it's not about, well, I have a right to see my child. You do, but it's more that the child has the right to have a good relationship with both parents without interference, without feeling guilty, you know, of enjoying time with both parents and not being put in the middle. So I think the first time, first is separating out those two relationships and recognizing that the child has a right to that relationship. And then the other is something I alluded to earlier, which is you got to get that self-care and that help with healing. It has to be a decision, a conscious decision to heal and move forward. Some people set up camp and pack a lunch for staying in the place of, I'm hurt, I'm wounded, you did me wrong. Yeah, that's all true, now what? You know, you cannot punish that person forever because if you do, it ends up punishing your child. Um, and, and that's one thing that keeps people from moving forward is they, they're so afraid of letting that person off the hook that if I'm civil, if I'm cordial, if I don't cuss him out every time I see him, he doesn't know that he hurt me or, you know, he's getting away with it or whatever. And it's like there has to be a willingness to say, you know what, I love my child more than I need to keep punishing this person because you can't do both. You know, there's just no way to keep punishing this person without it somehow negatively impacting your child. Um, And so it's hard. It is hard, especially when you feel like you have been let down and wrong. Um, But, again, your child is your motivator. You don't want your child to be the kind of person that is walking around holding a grudge all the time and stuck in the past. And You want to model for your child, you know what, people hurt us, people disappoint us, life doesn't go as planned, things go left sometimes. Who do you want your child to be when that happens to them? You want them to pick themselves up. You want them to keep living their best life. Well, they got to see you do that. Or, you know, or they're not going to know how to do it. If they see you being negative and bitter and all of that, then that's what they're going to do. Um, And it, you know, if they realize that their other parent is the object of that negativity, it makes it really um, hard for them because it's like, wait a minute, you know, my dad hates my mom, my mom hates my dad. Can I love them? Are they going to hate me? I mean, it's just a lot of conflict that when we do these things, our our kids are really watching us for clues about what is okay and if they're okay and if it's okay to love and all those things. So we want to affirm them as much as possible. And so that's why the negativity directed to each other is, is, you know, really toxic on several levels. And finally, I think that um, if people can take a long view, because, you know, in the moment and, you know, when you've been through a breakup, when you've been betrayed, when you've been hurt, you, it's hard to look, you know, 
a year out even, you know, much less five years or 10 years or whatever. But if people can take a long view and say, you know, what do I want my child to say about me and how I handled this, you know, mm-hmm. when they're a parent, you know, when they're a teenager or whatever, um, you know, do I want them to be like the children who said, you know, my parents got divorced and they still kept fighting. I still didn't get a break, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. or was you right. know, my parents split up and I know they really didn't like each other, but they both loved me so much that, you know, they came to both of my events and they were kind, you know, they were civil to each other. You know, it's not even about being friends. People are like, oh, do I have to be friends with her? Do I have to be friends with them? No, you don't have to be friends. You just have to yeah. spare your kids all that conflict. Um, and not that they, you know, kids know, that, I mean, they have to know how to work through conflict. So you're modeling the mature, productive way to, to handle conflict and to deal with people you don't like. You know, I mean, it's, it's okay. Kids yeah. know when parents don't like each other. But, how, but, you know, if we're at our job and there's somebody we don't like, we don't go in every day cussing them out and carrying on. You know, we're still professional. <laughs> You know, so you still might have to treat your co-parent like a business partner. Um, But basically, you know, that's what you want your kid to look back and say, you know, it wasn't easy. I know my parents, you know, they broke up and there was a reason they broke up, but they both loved me so much that, you know, they kept showing up for me. You know, they never said a bad word about each other. You know, they made it comfortable for me. You know, whenever I went to my dad's, my mom told me to have a good time. When I came back from my mom's, my dad asked me to have a good time, you know. Those kinds of things really matter to kids. And so when they look back, you know, what kind of memories do you want them to have? Um, And that, you know, if you're not there yet, that's something to work towards. Wow. And you know what? When I was hearing you speak, Isha, it just uh, reinforced and reminded me of my own experience and how much I just look up to my mother and how she really um, was able to push past the pain and focus on us. She always taught us to be respectful to our father, even to be respectful to his wife, which was, Mm -hmm. you know, the other woman, for lack of a better phrase. You know, Mm -hmm. she never um, showed that or displayed that pain or really had blurred lines. You know, yes, Mm -hmm. I was hurt, but this is still your father. And so, my goodness, I feel like my life was so full and rich and just uh, full of love. And Mm -hmm. it just really was a model for me how to treat other people. You are absolutely right. And it seems like it's the ultimate sacrifice um, in a sense that you um, kind of don't mix the two, but at the same time you dealt with it. It's not that you're saying Mm -hmm. you can't address or deal with those emotions, but it's who you bring into those emotions. And your children definitely you do not want them to be involved in that. I hear that you were saying that you guys got counseling and, you know, other avenues to address mm-hmm. those um, issues. And that's and that's key to me. Uh, wouldn't you agree? Like, I think maybe a lot of parents um, going through divorces maybe don't really tap into that resource. They don't. And even worse, you know, so that not only do they miss out on the opportunity and the, the, the resource that a counselor or, you know, a divorce recovery group can provide, um, unfortunately, some of them really start to lean on their own children um, as confidants, mm-hmm. as emotional support, because they're right physically there in proximity, and it's very easy, um, deceptively easy to say, we're going through this together. Yes and no. You're both going through the experience of divorce, but your divorce experiences and needs are totally different. But, you know, people will rely on their kids and kids start feeling responsible for parents and they feel like they have to take sides. And instead of the parent, you know, taking care of the child, it's the other way around. And so that's one of the downsides of people not getting help is that without even realizing it, they may be leaning on their children, which is not appropriate. Yeah, not healthy at all. And so that kind of brings me to the question we kind of um, sort of lightly touched on earlier. Uh, When you have two people who are like you and your ex that are on the same page in regards to co-parenting, but then one or both of you get involved in new romantic relationships, what Mm -hmm. advice do you have for parents? I heard you give a little piece of advice uh, earlier. So uh, would you mind going into more detail as far as what advice sure. you have for parents when it comes to bringing in new significant others? Um, take your time for your kids' sake, for your own sake, for the sake of safety, <laughs> take your time. Um, there's no reason to rush into um, relationships in general. Take time to get to know people um, and for them to get to know your kids. 
Um, and then that also gives you time to kind of let those, you know, we all know what those feelings of, of new love feel like. You know, it's, it's like being mm-hmm. on a drug. You're, you know, you're in the clouds and you don't necessarily see things very clearly. So taking your time in the relationship allows some of that to simmer down and everybody to kind of have a clear head. So that's, you know, one benefit of waiting. Um, the other is, you know, because you're ready to date may not mean that your kids are ready to meet someone new, nor is it necessary or even appropriate for your kids to meet everybody that you date. Um, because if it's, there's like a revolving door of people coming in, it doesn't necessarily, you know, um, help kids, especially when they're still dealing with the breakup of their parents. So it's like, okay. well, am I supposed to like and get to know this person? Oh, wait, he's gone. And oh, now there's somebody else. And so it gives them kind of a, 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 a unhealthy sense of connecting to people because kids, you know, will either not want to deal with anybody, especially if there's just a ton of people coming along. So when you finally do meet someone, it's like, well, is I going to stick around, you know, or they yeah. attach to people very quickly, but then you and that person break up and they never see them again, you know. So it, there's a lot at stake in terms of introducing your kids to lots of different people. Um, and, you know, and safety is a factor as well. Um, but then once you feel like, um, you know, you want to, you know, introduce, oh, let me back up. So it's not that you can't date or anything like that. I'm not saying that. Or that your kids can't know that you date. Like one of the things that I would say to my kids is that, um, well, then they, they were asking me if I went on dates. And I said, yes. And they said, we never see you go on a date. And I said, yeah, because I go on dates when you're with your dad. So they were like, mm-hmm. oh, you know, so I didn't take away time from them. So that was the first thing. The second thing was they were like, well, how come we can't ever see the people you date? And I said, because you're so special that only the most special people get to meet you. And I haven't met anybody special enough to meet you. And I think that's wow. true. That You know, our kids are special, and they need to know that only really special people you know, good people are going to get to meet them. And so that takes time to get to know somebody and know if they're special enough. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times people are so excited to move on or they're so in love um, and they're ready, but their kids aren't ready. And, uh, you know, there's one um, one uh, guy, Ron Deal, he has a, a whole step family ministry and, and a series of books. And, and um, I interviewed him once and he said that, Whenever you think you're ready to introduce your new partner to your kids, your kids are about a year away from being ready. <laughs> so nobody wants to hear wow. that, of course, you know, because right. you're already a chomping at the bit. But that doesn't mean your yeah. kids are going to be excited about it. Um, so you can spend that time, you know, kind of priming the pump and getting them ready and, and preparing them and then, you know, introducing this person as a friend or, you know, mom's friend or whatever and not expecting this person, the, the kids and this person are going to just immediately love each other and, you know, you need to give each other space. And, you know, somebody um, wrote to us once through the, the co-parenting site and was like, I'm ready, you know, to meet my boyfriend's kids and we're going to do it at Thanksgiving and we're also going to tell them that I'm pregnant and I want to just oh. go through the computer. Like, are you kidding me? So oh, that's goodness. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, back yeah. to coming to Thanksgiving alone, that's a holiday, that's family time. That That's not the best time to introduce the new girlfriend, not, not even a fa- the fact that she's pregnant. We don't even talk about that. Um, right, but, right. <laughs> you know, but, yeah, you know, so the kid's birthday, holiday is not a good time. You know, keep it low-key, no pressure, because kids, you know, they pick stuff up. So, you know, you mm-hmm. just want it to be something where they have a chance to get to know this person and have that freedom. And then if you're the co-parent on the other side of that, you know, it's good if you can, you know, have an opportunity to meet the person beforehand, you know, if that might be a courtesy that the other parent will afford. And and then when your kid says, oh, I met so-and-so, you're like, oh, yeah, I met her too, you know, but, you know, she seemed nice or whatever. If you can't say anything nice, just keep it neutral. Did you have a good time? You know, so Mm -hmm. allowing that space because, the person is going to be there for as long as your co-parent wants them to be there. You know, you can't control their dating life as long as, you know, your child is safe. How you feel about the person is really irrelevant. Um, So there's no need to put that on your kids. If it's somebody that you absolutely can't stand or if it was the other woman or the other man and so forth, doesn't matter really because if they're going to be there, it needs to be as comfortable for your kids as possible. Um, now, sometimes kids will say, oh, you know, I, I'm not comfortable or she's always around or she's always, you know, trying to be my mom or whatever. And then, you know, that's an occasion for a conversation and things like that. Um, but that's a time when the communication between parents and kids and between parents, you know, co-parents with each other is really important because 
you know, there's a difference between saying, you know, so-and-so is feeling a little uncomfortable around your girlfriend. I've encouraged her to talk to you about it versus, you know, she doesn't like her and you need to stop bringing her, you know, <laughs> totally different, you know, flies, uh-huh. you know, catch more flies with honey. Than- yes. So when I'm listening to this, Disha, it just brings something to mind that I think for people, dating is, you just made it so clear that dating after divorce is a totally different ball game, a totally different approach than um, dating um, before marriage or before children, I should really mm-hmm. emphasize. It's like a whole other process where maybe when you were younger and you were dating, it was a little more uh, loose and carefree, but you really mm-hmm. have to consciously take it one step at a time. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, that's something that I think, yes, you're doing it for the children, but Disha, wouldn't you agree? Like, it's also very therapeutic and very good for you because after going through a divorce and experiencing that hurt and pain and going from one relationship where maybe you were together for quite a while and then mm-hmm. going into something new, you really should take your time anyway. So it seems like it would be a win-win. Don't you agree? It, I do, but it's so hard. And I say that as somebody who yeah. had a hard time, you know, after, mm-hmm. you know, I'd been with the same person since I was 18 years old and I was, you know, 35 at that point. Um, wow. And so, you know, it, it's so easy to get caught up in getting your needs met through dating that it really can mask some other kind of healing work that you might need to do. Or if you haven't figured out some of the issues in your relationship that didn't work, you know, you could be repeating those same, you know, issues. You might be attracting the same kind of person that didn't work out, or you might behave, be behaving in ways that didn't, you know, um, that contributed to the you know, end of your um, previous relationship. So there's a lot you need to kind of learn about yourself. Like you got to do that, you know, relationship CSI, <laughs> kind of figure out uh-huh. like, what went wrong and, you know, what, how much of this was about me and what can I do differently? What kind of person, you know, is good for me? You know, what's a good mate? Can I enjoy my own company? You know, if you have a real problem being by yourself, um, you know, and just jump into something, you know, there's some un- unhealed stuff going on there and it's not going to help your next relationship. So it, you kind of owe it to yourself mm-hmm. and the next person, you know, to take the time and do that work and really kind of get comfortable with yourself. Mm, that's powerful. And it makes me think of Gwyneth Paltrow and her husband, um, ex-husband rather, uh, co-plays Chris Martin, and that uh, that infamous phrase, conscious uncoupling. <laughs> and I actually read your blog, uh, and I was really, it was a delight to read, and it was such a breath of fresh air to read your uh, take your perspective to that because my goodness we all remember that phrase and how many yes. times did we you know hear about it and um, people were poking fun at it but uh, share with us your perspective to that situation you know had it not been Gwyneth Paltrow <laughs> who just makes <laughs> us roll our eyes for so many reasons I mean you know so yes I mean in some ways she was trying to act like she was like the special snowflake of divorce you know I'm not like these other divorce people <laughs> you know, who were just so unconscious and just willy-nilly uncoupling. Um, but, you know, she was really on to something in that um, it, she was she, she's encouraging people or talking about a process of being very thoughtful as you bring your relationship to an end and thinking about your role as, in what happened and thinking about your kind of next steps and your own personal development. And one benefit of that approach is that if you're focused on yourself, then that's less time you have to be stewing over who this other person and what they did and did not do. And so yes. it definitely um, is an approach that allows you to um, grow and it allows you to be more fully present for your children because you're not focused on what the other person, you know, did or what their process is, or what they're doing next. As long as they're doing right by your kids, that's all, you know, and anything beyond that is not your business. Um, so, you know, I initially, I couldn't resist the urge to, you know, jump on the bandwagon and, and poke fun at her. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, she was kind of on to something. Yeah, I, I just couldn't agree with you more. And I have you to thank for offering that uh, take on it and giving that perspective because, yeah, I was one of the eye rollers, you know, like, what is she talking about? But, you know, after hearing you and, <clears throat> excuse me, and looking at your book, I get it. I get 
where she was headed when she was uh, using that phrase. So Mm -hmm. speaking of your book, um, please share with the listeners, our listeners, Co-Parenting 101. Tell us a little bit about the book, uh, about your website. You have a blog. You have workshops, speaking engagements. Please share. So um, when my ex and I split up, um, people would make comments to us. And and we, let's see, we separated in 2005, and our divorce was finalized in 2006. And... um, you know, people would say, you know, you guys are like the poster children for divorce. And like, you know, nobody wants to be that, (laughs) you know, you want to be a poster child (laughs) for a good marriage. But, you know, I get what they were saying, which was, you know, we seem to be, you know, not fighting and and flipping out and all of that. And our kids seem to be doing okay. So, um, you know, it was a real compliment. Um, And then, you know, someone would, people would say, you know, you guys should write a book. And I'm a writer. Um, my ex-husband is a banker. And so he said, yeah, you know, I think they're on to something. You really should write a book. And I said, well, yeah, but I think it might be more powerful if it came from both of us. So then I set out mm-hmm. to figure out, well, how do you write a nonfiction book? Because primarily at that time, you know, I've been doing some personal essays, but I was actually working on a novel. And so I found out that, you know, for nonfiction, you have to have a book proposal and this idea of a platform from which you will market your book. And so, um, you know, social media is the place where you have a platform these days. And, you know, so we set up a blog. Never, you know, didn't really know what we were doing, but we set up a blog because we wanted (laughs) to hear from co-parents and find out, you know, what would they want in a book? What are some of the issues they're facing? Because, you know, we had had our experience, but, you know, we really didn't know um, what concerns and things that people might want to read in a book. We wanted it to be a resource um, to help families. So um, over the several years that we were completing our proposal and shopping it around, we had an agent. Um, we were just building the site, and we started doing um, a monthly um, radio show on Blog Talk Radio and meeting guests and hearing from co-parents that way. Um, and then um, writing the book, um, and the book came out in 2013, and um, it, you know, and it's been great. And we have um, our Twitter account, and so we've been able to reach out to people that way and answer questions, and you know, generate some good conversations about co-parenting. Because what we really want to do through the book and through our presence on social media is just to change the way, as a culture, we talk about parenting after a breakup. From one, you know, conversations that kind of presume this negativity and that people are going to be combative, to one that normalizes you know, being civil, you know, again, not friendly, just civil and just, Mm -hmm. you know, sparing your kids the conflict. So we have a dedicated private Facebook group. So in that group, parents come and talk about all aspects of their co-parenting. We've been invited to um, churches, to the National PTA Conference. Um, I'm going locally to um, the Center for Women here in Pittsburgh. Um, They do workshops for women in transition. So I'm doing a co-parenting workshop there. So basically, um, we just talk about co-parenting whenever anybody wants us to um, and and really want to just encourage families so that, um, you know, children uh, whose parents break up can thrive. Um, and, And, you know, parents for the most part mean well and want to you know, help their kids, but they don't always know how, and it can be so lonely and so overwhelming. And so if our Mm -hmm. book, you know, can help someone in that regard or a Facebook group, you know, that's what we want to do. And that is just truly such an incredible mission and gift and opportunity. Like the platform that you guys have is amazing because, you know, the statistics are out there, Deisha. I mean, it's Mm -hmm. a huge percent. What is it? I believe the last time I checked about 53% of marriages end in divorce. Uh, and then it's absolutely. even higher for second marriages, and even higher for oh. second marriages with kids involved. So if there are mm-hmm. kids involved and their parents remarry, they have a very high risk of going through a second divorce, which nobody wants, you know. So, right. yeah, it, it's affecting millions of children. It is, and it's something that, you know, people, like, kind of try to shy away from. We want to see and think about, you know, the wedding day and the cake and, Mm -hmm. you know, the wedding gown and all of that good stuff. But it's real. I mean, this is the reality for, like you said, um, millions of children. And so I feel like your platform is incredible because you are offering help. You are offering resources and support uh, to families who are going through that, which is so needed. And a quote that's on your site, I just love this quote, Divorce and marriages, but families endure, mm-hmm. but families endure. And that is just really, to me, just 
something on a personal level as a daughter, I couldn't agree with you more. It's so true. You don't, just because a marriage ends doesn't mean that the family has to be in shambles. Right, right. Uh And from a child's perspective, you know, they really need the security of knowing that they still have and are still part of a loving family. Yes, yes. Well, Disha, you are just, someone that I happened to meet at the Pittsburgh Brown Mamas party, and I just immediately just knew you were going to be a huge blessing to the listeners of Mom Talk with Denise LaRosa. So I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your day. Yes, you got it. And I just wish you and your ex-husband the best with um, everything you set forth to do, because I know it's um, going to really have such a positive impact on so many families. So thank you so much for what you do. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. And um, if your listeners, if you want to do any kind of, you know, giveaway with books, I have some books to donate to your show. Oh, thank you so much. So everybody heard that. So please, please, please send out an email to me, Denise at deniseandlarosa.com or um, hop on my Facebook page, Mom Talk with Denise LaRosa. However you can reach out, uh, please reach out and we will have some books for you. Thank you for tuning in. Be sure to stay in touch with me by visiting www.deniseandlarosa.com. Follow me on Twitter at Denise and LaRosa, on Facebook, Mom Talk with Denise LaRosa, and or email me at Denise at DeniseAndLaRosa.com. You can also sign up for my newsletter by emailing newsletter at DeniseAndLaRosa.com. Also, to get your free copy of Co-Parenting 101, please send me an email at Denise at DeniseAndLaRosa.com. We are only giving away five copies, so please act fast. You have been listening to Mom Talk with Denise LaRosa. I will leave you with this quote by Maya Angelou. You may not control all the events that happen to you, but you can decide not to be reduced by them. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you would like to see more, please do me a favor and subscribe to my YouTube channel or check out some more videos.